Thank you. All right. So, like I said, we're going to be starting this material, Growing in Grace. And really, the, the text for this comes from Second Peter. Um, really, um, you know, in, in Jeremiah in Lesson 2 points this out, but, but, but we recognize this idea of growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It, the, the epistle ends with it in Second Peter, but it also begins with it. And so it acts as bookends of this, this idea of growing and growing in grace. And as we get going through, we're certainly going to go through the various, uh, what is commonly referred to as the Christian graces there at the beginning of chapter 1. But tonight's lesson and then Sunday, next Wednesday, so lesson one and lesson two, hits on really this right here, this idea, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now tonight we're going to focus in on grace. And then, like I said, on Sunday, going into part two, Jeremiah's going to pick up with talking about um, that uh, grace is multiplied through knowledge and those types of things. But tonight the focus is on Grace. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Before we kind of dive into that and into the lesson, and he kind of hits on this a little bit as, as Jeremiah writes this, but we always want to understand the context of what's going on in the scripture that we are going to be studying, right? Regardless if it's a topic or whatever, we want to understand that context. So 2 Peter chapter 3, well, not, not, not just chapter 3, but 2 Peter. Again, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Bookends, starting in with it. What's going on in this epistle? I don't know if you guys went through and read through the entire epistle in your study for this. But what what stands out about Second Peter? What uh, is he, he's telling them to grow, and they're to grow in grace and knowledge, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But there's a reason for it. What, what things is Peter dealing with here? Second Peter chapter two. Off the time to go there, and what, what, what do we think about? There's false teachers. Because there's false teachers, and they are going to be present, just like they were in the days of the prophets, right? There are false prophets. There's going to be false teachers even today. Because of that, you need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Well, because there's false teachers. And what are false teachers? They're teaching false doctrine. If you're not growing in grace and knowledge, what could what, what is the potential there? What could happen? They fool you, you follow them, you give heed and and ear, right? It talks about there in 2 Peter chapter 2 near the end, the fact that they are speaking these these words that are great and everything sounds good, but they're empty and they're vain. And if you're not growing in the things that you need to be growing in, there's a potential to um, give in to them, to follow them, to have them influence you. And then they lead you down a path of apostasy. Not only that, he points out one of the doctrines in which they are teaching is a doctrine that has to do with the second coming of Christ. And in that, he points out there in 2 Peter chapter 3, especially at the beginning, that uh, what they're teaching in their influence in that is completely wrong. And you know better, look at these evidences that all come from the word of God. And the point in that is the fact that Christ is going to return. And if Christ is going to return, he's long-suffering and he's patient. God's long-suffering and patient. But if Christ is going to return, what does that, and that's really what 2 Peter 3, comes, 18, comes off the heels of, what do we need to make sure that we're doing? Not only is there false teachers, Christ is coming again. What does that mean we need to do? We need to grow, right? And so that's really, you know, kind of, kind of quickly a little bit there. But the context of what's going on there, and there, there's some other things that can be brought up. So we need to grow in the grace and knowledge. And I think most of us uh, understand, okay, uh, we, we need to grow in knowledge, right? We need to uh, dig into God's word and have a knowledge of it. And there are certainly some things that Jeremiah is going to pull out in Sunday's class that are uh, going to go right, right, right into that and tie right into that. But this idea of the fact that we are to grow in grace, I think can sometimes be maybe a little bit confusing. And I think it's because of the confusion people have whenever they think of grace, Oftentimes, grace might be painted and put in this type of thing that it's all of God and none of us. And there's this passiveness from the individual whenever it comes to grace. That God's acting and we're just sitting back and doing nothing. In fact, that's one of the things that Jeremiah points out real quickly and that we are essentially going to get to in this lesson. He points out, and this is uh, down in the third paragraph on page five, so it's the front page there. 
that uh, the true grace of the gospel message is not something we passively observe, but actively receive and participate in. In other words, yes, we are to grow in grace, but oftentimes when we think of grace, and we're going to get to this, there's certainly the cross, but we think of God acting and maybe us not doing anything, us being passive in that. And that's really what the idea of this lesson is, is to get us to understand, no, the very terminology that we are to grow in the grace would mean that we are to be doing something. The man is to do something along with God's actions, and we're going to get into that, but man is to receive that, and we are to actively participate in that. If you don't walk away with anything else from tonight's lesson, please walk away with that. Because that's really the, the, the point that is trying to be driven. And as it goes on, and in, in Jeremiah will talk about in lesson two, and as he teaches through it, if you're not growing in grace, you're not going to be growing in the knowledge like you should. If you're not growing in knowledge and you're not growing in grace, the two really go hand in hand and together. But understand there is a active sense in which we are to be participating in this. Has anybody uh, got anything else before we kind of jump on in really to kind of some of the main points because we go through and we look at different aspects of grace and we're going to look at this and we're going to go through it but just an introductory remarks does anybody have anything else Aaron the two things I think of the most that we're going into this is and you alluded to the, the term obedience and then in Second Peter chapter 1 the idea of purity and so the only way that we can be found in favor with God is to be pure yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And that is what we are going to be hitting on as we get going, that be pure, do something that we need to do, which is being obedient. How do we have access into that grace? By, by faith. That is something that we do. It's not a passive thing. Very good. DJ? Yeah, no doubt. This is something that we do, that we actively grow in, and there is a change that is in our life. And that is an aspect of grace, and that's, that's really what we're going to see, like I said, as we go through through this lesson. We start off looking at, you know, like, and, and maybe I could have hit on this earlier when I was talking about it, but the fact that we understand the issue of not growing in knowledge, right? Like that's something that, for, that, that clicks with us real easy. Yeah, if I'm not growing in knowledge, I'm not studying God's word, I'm not making the application, then I'm going uh, to be destroyed, like we talked about, right? The potential of the false teachers influencing us, influencing us, us going off into apostasy. We see that in Hosea uh, 4, 6. And that's one of the things that's pointed out um, in the lesson and this point out there in Hosea that if you have a lack of knowledge, you're not studying, you're not growing, you're not... Strive, you're not meditating upon God's word along with that, seeking to understand it and make its application, you will be destroyed. But as we see in 2 Peter 3.18, it's not just knowledge. It's not just knowledge in of itself, or gnosis. But grace is also an aspect of this. Now, right here we have the definition. We have their definition. There's kind of a lot of definitions through this first lesson. Okay, and we're going to go to various scriptures to kind of to, to, to go along with it and to prove, prove the points. But this first one, grace, um, the Greek word charis, or charis, I believe it's charis, but charis, goodwill, loving kindness, favor. All right? Most of us would, would agree to that and, and, and understand that. It's goodwill towards man, okay? uh, loving kindness, a favor that is there. Sometimes we refer to it as an unmerited favor, all those kinds of things. But as we get into and look at the different uses of it, and that's the point of this lesson, um, we're going to notice that um, we're, 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 we're going to notice that while this definition, let me back up here. While this definition is good and that is accurate and that is right, it's not just that in of itself. There's different levels to it. There's different. There, there, there's a different depth to it. I don't know if you call it multifaceted, 
but there is definitely some different things to it as it is used in Scripture, and that we have the definition, especially for Martin Gingrich, that's the way we go through it, that I believe helps us understand this command to grow in grace. Okay? Whenever we look at it, when we just think about grace, well, how do I grow in something that God's just, you know, doing? Well, if, if, if that's all you think that grace is, is it God's goodwill towards man, then there's nothing else that I need to do, then yeah, you might be a little bit, how do I grow in grace? But as we look at it and as we get into these different layers or different levels, I think it's going to help us understand it a little bit more. This first piece, and I'm sorry if I'm going to end up flying through this, but you guys know me, if I don't, I, there's no way I'm getting through this tonight. This first piece, and there's really three different aspects that uh, is brought out in this lesson for Martin Gingrich's definitions, okay? The first one, grace is God's disposition, disposition of favor towards us. This aspect that Art and Gingrich brings out, at least in, in their definition, um, is a benef uh, beneficent disposition towards someone, favor, grace, gracious care, help, goodwill. And really what this is, is you would think about it as in, this is God's disposition towards someone. It, it, this is God's disposition towards man. This is his spirit. This is his character. This is what he thinks towards man. We're going to get into the action piece here in a minute. Okay? God certainly acts. But God just has a disposition of good will of good favor, favor towards man. And that's really what this part is bringing out. And then we're going to kind of go on from there. So let's look at that in Acts 14, 26. Somebody want to read that for me? From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Okay, very good. And then Acts 15, 40 have something a little bit similar as far as there was a work that was completed, right? Doing the work of God, and those people, what did they do? They commended them to the grace of God. Now, I believe this was a question in the lesson, but what, what, what does that mean? You can look at your question and, and the answer you might, might have wrote down. But these people commended them to the grace of God. Right. Yeah, no doubt that God would have this disposition towards them that as they had need, right, might be safety issues, might be work, right, open doors, open opportunities, that God has this disposition towards his people, especially as they're doing his work, of goodwill and favor toward them that they would be able to accomplish those things. They'd be maybe safe on their journey. He would provide them with their needs, maybe be food or some other thing. But God has this disposition towards him. And again, like it says here down in the bullet point, especially of a beneficent intention or a beneficent intention of God. This is God's intentions, goodwill towards man, especially those who are doing his work. He has this disposition towards them. Okay, We see this also as we get into this aspect of God's attitude of beneficence in John 1, 14, Luke 19, 10, 2 Peter 3, 9, and 1 Timothy 2, 4. We can go through and read all those, but especially the last three, Luke 19, 10, 2 Peter 3, 9, 1 Timothy 2, 4. God has a disposition and attitude towards man that what does he want for all of man? What does he want? man to do. Be saved, right? That's why Christ came. Christ came, and that's what it talks about there in John 1, 14. He was full of grace and truth, right? The word, the incarnate word, Christ came. He's full of grace and truth. Luke 19, 10, talking about the whole purpose of Jesus' coming is to seek and to save that which was lost. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is um, long-suffering. He's patient, not willing that any should perish. In 1 Timothy 2, 4, God wants all to be saved. That is God's disposition towards man. And that is what this aspect or this definition, I guess, see, I need to keep up. I got like my slides on the iPad here, but I got to click through. So sorry. 
But this is God's attitude that he has. It's his disposition that he has towards me. All right? I think all of us understand that. God wants what's best for man. He wants them, first and foremost, to be saved. He wants what's best for those who are doing his work. But the other aspect or the other definition that kind of comes up off of this is that God not only has that disposition, that attitude that he wants all to be saved, that he wants what he wants what is best for man in his eyes, and he understands what's best, but that God also acts on that. In other words, the practical application of goodwill. God's grace, or sorry, grace is God's gift of favor for us. And so as we work through this, I believe that that's what we see. Okay, so grace. You've got to grow in the grace. What is grace? Come to understand it. Well, God has this disposition or attitude for man. He wants to goodwill towards man. But not only does he have that disposition or attitude, he then acts upon that disposition or attitude. He does something with that. It's a practical application of that goodwill. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Well, I feel like I'm the only one talking because like, I'm looking down, probably not asking too many questions. That's right. That mindset is there, that disposition. And as we're going to see through these verses here, right, as we roll through it, the action has clearly backed that up. Go ahead, Scott. Well, we show our, um, our appreciation for his grace by our actions mm-hmm. that follow. You know, I mean, you can sit there and think it's a get-out-of-jail card, free card, you know, uh, and... You know, not live the life you could, but should, but God's grace is going to take care of it. Or you appreciate God's grace and put it into action and, and learn in knowledge and, and do the things that you're supposed to do that God wants you to do. That's the way you're showing your appreciation for that grace. Yeah, that's a, that's a real good point. It's a reciprocating action that is there. And I believe that that was another aspect um, that... Uh, was in there in some different lexicon. I can't remember which one it was that I looked at, but a reciprocating action is something that we are to have with that. God's grace, he has this mindset of goodwill towards man, but then he also shows that he doesn't, you know, we don't just read about the fact that, yeah, God wants what's best for us. He, he has goodwill and favor. He has really good intentions for us, you know, but that he actually acted upon it. And we see that and then from our perspective, there's to be this reciprocating action. Now, there's another aspect of it that we're going to get into here in a little bit as far as us receiving that and the effects that it has on us. But no doubt that reciprocating action uh, because of what God has done for us needs to be there. Sherry, did you have something? Yeah, no, no doubt. And, and again, that's, that's uh, kind of what we're going to get to in the last point, this idea that God has this mindset, goodwill towards man. He acted upon it by, he's, we're going to see he sent his son. He gave us his word. But those things in and of themselves isn't where it's supposed to end. There's supposed to be an effect on us as well. And I'm jumping ahead of myself. But that, that, that's where we're going. It's exactly right. So the practical application, right? So we... We can read throughout God's word. We see that he has this mindset, this disposition, good intentions towards man. He wants what's best for them. He has his favor for them. But we also see it in action. We recognize from 1 Peter 5.10 that God is the God of all grace. From James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from God. And when we look at Acts 14.17... 
we see the aspect of God provides for man, right? He provides rain. He provides these various things for man's needs. So we can see this aspect that, that God has, good, a good, uh, has a mindset of good intentions towards man. Really all of his uh, creation, all of mankind, right? We even think of Matthew 6. At least I did whenever I was thinking through this. And the fact that don't worry about tomorrow because Jesus is going to provide, or sorry, God is going to provide you with what you need. Recognize that and understand that. So God has acted in that way. But whenever we think about the spiritual aspect in which God has provided, the good in, the, 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 the mindset that he had of good intentions towards man, and then he acted in certain ways spiritually, really start to bring out and show um, God's thoughts towards man, how much he cares for man, and what grace is really all about. First and foremost, with the gift of Jesus. Now, Romans 3, 24 and 25. We can go there and read it, and then I will um, ask a question. Romans 3, 24 and 25. So we see the spiritual blessings, that Jesus is the manifestation of God's grace towards man. Somebody want to read Romans 3, 24 through 25 for me? Okay, very good. So, it kind of states it there, but how is Jesus the manifestation? How is Jesus showing grace? Right? We oftentimes will talk about it, and this is what a lot of people refer to as grace, and it is certainly an aspect of grace. I'm not downplaying that at all. <clears throat> but this is the manifestation of it. God had a goodwill mindset towards man, and he acted upon it by giving Jesus in what way was the action of Jesus, the gift of Jesus, showing his goodwill towards man. What happened there? He gave us Jesus, but, but what, what do we have through him? What is that gift? He paid, he paid the price of our sins, right? We were deserving of death. Separation from God from, for the actions in, that, that, that we took is, uh, in sinning, and then... Jesus came and paid that price. He bore that punishment that we were deserving of. <clears throat> through his sacrifice, we are justified. Through his sacrifice, we are redeemed. And through his sacrifice, there is a propitiation of our sins. That's the gift of Jesus. That is God acting. Not only does he want what's best for man, not only does he have that mindset or that intention. And let's go back to the end of the last point. The mindset or the intention that he wants all men to be saved. Okay, so God has that disposition or that attitude. Did he act upon that, though? Yeah, I, I mean, I want everyone to be saved. But he acted in some way to not only show that, but to give us an opportunity or an ability to be saved. That's grace. Has that disposition, but then the practical application and the proof is in the pudding, I guess, as they yeah, some people might say. The proof is there, right? He gave us his son. And we see throughout Scripture what that gift means, what that gift represents. There is an opportunity to be saved. Now, this is where we start to get into, at least at this, at this point, and we're going to talk about the Word of God, and then we're going to go down and talk about a little bit more man's actions. But this is where, whenever we started off the lesson, and I was talking about the fact that grace is not just all God, none of man. Grace is not just a active, or sorry, a passive uh, role that man plays and God does everything. God, certainly, man could do nothing to save himself. God had to act in that way, and that is grace, and he proved it. But is there something, in other words, is the, the reception of this grace, is it conditional or unconditional? It's conditional, okay? The grace that was shown through the gift of Jesus... It is there, it is for all to have access to. No doubt God wants all to be saved. But the acceptance, the receiving of that gift, of this grace is conditional. Where would we go to prove that? 
Go to Romans. If you go over to Romans 5, what does it say? 5 2. It's access by faith, right? So this grace that has been offered to all of man, there's a way to access. And I, and I, I love the terminology there because that's what lays it out, right? This grace, this gift was given, or the, the gift was given to man. There is grace that is there, but there is only access to it by or through faith. Now, we can go into a whole other lesson and describe what faith means. But obedience has to play in it, another thing like that. We all understand that there is some active action that man has to take in order to have access to that grace. Larry? So when, I, when I read that question that I, I read in paragraphs, you saw some examples you gave, I answered that uh, conditional and unconditional. There are some things that are unconditional, and I used uh, the scripture Some things like uh, he used the example of a rain, fruitful season, <coughs> sun. Those are all things that are right. completely unconditional. And even Jesus' death on the cross, that was unconditional. He did that. That was his plan. Now, whether you avail yourself of that, whether you take advantage of that, that's totally conditional. If you, whether you're going to live a good life or you're going to live an evil life, that's totally up to you. Right. It's totally conditional. You're given life. You're given the good things of this life. You're even given to go to heaven, but whether you avail yourself of that, so that's how I answered that. Some things conditional, some things unconditional. Yeah, so whenever we think about God's grace, certainly he reigns in everything on the just and the unjust, right? All of us are blessed in those ways, but as far as the spiritual aspect of this, I believe what we see with the gift of Jesus, Jesus was given to man, right? Or as far as he was provided, that sacrifice was provided, but that isn't an unconditional action on man. Man has to do something. And even with the word of God that we're going to get into, God's word was given to all. But we have to actually do something in order to grow in the grace and in the knowledge as we should. At least that's how um, I had taken, I think it was, like you said, it was a question, but but that aspect of it, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that, Jeremiah. No, it's all- Right. He didn't do anything for him to send him to the earth to die, but the application of it is to me. That's right. So, it's so we have access um, to that grace by faith. That's what we recognize in Romans 5 2. So, um, again, God has that mindset or that disposition towards man, He acted in giving us His Son. Not only that, though. There's more to grace than just as, um, at least I've, I've referred to it as before, and I've heard it referred to as the cross. The cross, no doubt, was a manifestation, the gift of a son, of God's grace. Okay, God's goodwill, intentions towards man, and then acting upon that. But so is his word, the gift of the word. Okay, we see in Romans 8.2. Romans chapter 8, verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so we recognize that while Jesus and the gift that is there is something that is of grace, to God, uh, that, that, that is of grace, and that only through Jesus, only through his sacrifice, which we were not deserving of, but only through that can we be made right, can we be cleansed and forgiven of our sins, but how do we know about that? What has the power to convict somebody of their wrong to make them realize that they, one, need to repent and change, but two, access that grace by faith? Kind of just gave it away, I guess, with the terminology if we think of another scripture, but what tells us that? The Word of God, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God and then uh, so that's in Romans 10, 17, back up to Romans 1, 16 and 17, right? The power of the gospel, the word of God, right? Or the word of God, the gospel, is the power of God and the salvation. And so we recognize that the word of God is also a gift that was given to man. 
And so God, and, and it is through that gift that we uh, are saved as well. It is through the law that Spirit, the Spirit gave us, okay? It is through the law that, that has been revealed that we have, uh, that we're able to be made free from sin and death. We recognize the blood of Christ plays a role in that as well. But we read about that. We find out about that. We're convicted of these things by God's word. And so the gift of God's word is another practical application of God's goodwill toward man. You think about that, uh, but, but before I go on to that, you know, we, we also read more about God's word in 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. And then again in Titus 2. 11 and through 14, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Father, or of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Okay? He goes on to say, who, uh, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purifying, uh, sorry, purifying himself, his own special people, zealous. For good works. So we recognize something, again, sorry I'm falling behind there on the charts, uh, but we recognize something from that. Jesus was a manifestation of God's goodwill towards man. So was God's word. Part of that is because through God's word, we're convicted and we're saved. But what else does God's word do? It convicts us of wrongdoing and what we need to do to be saved. Is that it? Does it stop there? It teaches us. Would we know what to do and how to live, how to be pleasing to God, how to rid our life of sin, if not for the revela- for not, if not for God's work, if not for God's revealed will? We wouldn't. That is an act of grace. God has good will, good intentions, mindset towards man. He gives us His Son. It is the propitiation of our sin, or for our sins. We're redeemed through Him. We're justified through Him. But He also gives us His Word. So that we can learn how to live a life that is, going back to Aaron's point, pure and whole. Doing the things that we need to do. And so that's one of the things that we need to recognize as well. As much as Jesus is a manifestation of God's grace, so is his word. Because his word teaches us those things. And if we didn't have God's word, how would we all be acting? How would we be behaving? What would we be doing? Everyone would be doing their own thing. And you can see when people don't listen or don't read God's word, that's how they act and how they behave. So God's word is an an, an act of grace. And, you know, a lot of times whenever we think about God's word, there there is certainly the aspect of it. It teaches you how to live, to be pleasing to God so that we can be in heaven with him. And that is absolutely true, and that is the pinnacle. Don't ever forget that God's word brings us peace. And an understanding of your hope of heaven, so it helps you to have a peaceful life when you're here on this earth. doesn't mean that you're not going to have trials. But what it does mean, and we're going to see this with Paul, whenever he has a thorn in the flesh, he can get through it because of that hope that he has. But not only that, it talks about, and I should have wrote this down, I think it's in 2 Timothy, but it talks about the fact that uh, God's word is for the life that now is and for the life that is to come. So if someone can remember that, you can... Uh, you know, t- tell what verse that is, but I-, I believe it's in 2 Timothy. But the idea there is God's word makes our life here on this earth, whenever I say easier, that's not free of trials, but how to live it in such a way in which is going to be easier. And that is why I don't need to get off topic. Has anybody got any points or comments on that? Any thoughts? So we see that God's grace has an aspect of it, God's mindset or disposition towards man, but not only that, he acted upon that, he proved it in that way. But whenever God acted upon it and proved it, there isn't this thing where we just sit back and do nothing with it. In other words, there is meant to be an effect on us, those who are receiving this grace. God's grace is the effect produced by his favor. There's an effect that is to happen. This goes a little bit to the point that Scott was making earlier, the fact that there is a reciprocation of that. But whenever we think about what God's grace is to do, 
So God has good will, good intentions towards man. He acted upon that in a practical way by giving us his son and giving us his word. And if we grow in that grace, okay, so that comes with the understanding of how do I grow in grace? Well, God's word is grace. So I grow in that. And I grow in the fact that he sent me his son. Going back to what Scott was saying, the reciprocation of that in action or goodwill towards him. Whenever I do that and I'm growing in that grace, there is going to be an effect on me, namely a change in my life. People are going to see it. It is something that is, it's not something that is unidentifiable. It's not something that's nebulous and you can't see God's grace having an impact. God's grace is easily identifiable. Because if somebody is, has acted properly, they're not passive, they're acting on that grace and they are becoming this joint participant in the grace that God or favor that God is giving them. They're growing in the love of Christ. They're growing in the word of God. You're going to see that in their life. It is going to be evident. And that's really the point that we get at as we go through here. You think of Acts 11. Acts 11 verse 23 when Barnabas, clicking and it's not working for me. When Barnabas uh, went, um, went to those, and we read in verse 23, that when he came, he had seen the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all with purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. So they needed, so in other words, Barnabas came and he saw. It says he had seen the grace of God. What does that mean? How does one see the grace of God? And I kind of already said it, but what does that mean? You recognize it. You recognize it. And, and it's identifiable how? <laughs> the way in which they conduct their life. The grace was given to them by God. We're gonna, and I, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm not going to get into it. Jeremiah, I can get to it a little bit next time. Talking about a changed life, right? That's there with Paul, I believe, was not Second Corinthians, um, Second Corinthians 3. 18, right? And that idea that the grace of God is connected with glory, the grace of God is connected with knowledge, the grace of God is connected with power. They're all interconnected. If you have received the grace of God and you are acting as you should in an active sense, that light is going to be lit, right? We talk about letting our light shine. That's the idea there. Because you've accepted the grace from the standpoint of by faith, you've have, you have access to it and you're trying to grow in it. And as you grow in it, what's going to be manifested in that one's life? The action of the one that gave you that grace, right? So in this case, it would be God. So it goes back to Scott's point a little bit. You're going to be reciprocating it. Not from the standpoint of how I would do it, though, how God tells me to do it. I'm God showed me or uh, God provided me with this grace. He offered it out there he, and, and it's out there for all. And by my action and growing in it, what's going to end up happening is I'm going to be growing as he tells me to, to grow. Those Christian graces, those things are going to start to be illuminated and manifested in my life. How much time do I have left? Is that about it? One minute. Okay. Does anybody, I'll, I'll go ahead and stop there. Hey, I feel pretty good with where I got tonight. Jeremiah. That's a good point. That's where, you know, where you kind of ended with in the lesson, they're receiving his grace in vain. 
right? That's the idea of it. We don't want to be those who receive his grace in vain. So what does that mean we do? We need to grow in it. But I think it comes from a proper understanding of what grace is. Again, that idea of grow in grace can be confusing if we limit what grace is. Grace is a whole lot deeper than that. Grace is a mindset. Or, uh, uh, why can I not think of the word? I'm wanting to th- say <laughs> deposition, but that's because I sit in depositions from time to time. Not for me, for work. Um, <laughs> disposition. It's got its disposition towards mankind. Um, and he acted upon it, but there should be an effect that it has on us, and it should be evident. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, man, that was fun. That was the only one I'm going to do. So some of you might appreciate that. Some of you, I don't know. My son would like me teaching more. But uh, um, anyways, there are extras up here. Lesson two, Jeremiah's probably going to clean up some things I left off uh, there. But uh, you guys will be get, going over lesson two on Sunday.